A long-awaited digital reunion of all four members of the Beatles was made possible by cutting-edge technology before the Beatles issued Now and Then in the fall of last year. A happy finish to a 60-year odyssey, it gave fans the opportunity to hear Paul McCartney join voices with his late companion John Lennon once again. It was hailed as the final entry in the band's illustrious canon, and it was made available to them. This was a reunion that did not take place in actuality, despite the fact that it was quite poignant. McCartney was deprived of a close friend and the world of more possible Beatles albums as a result of the unfortunate fact that the Beatles never got back together in the studio before John Lennon was murdered on December 8, 1980. The collapse of the band at the beginning of the 1970s is commonly believed to have been the event that brought an end to the recording relationship between John Lennon and Paul McCartney. In point of fact, however, they collaborated surreptitiously in a studio in Los Angeles for a one-time spontaneous session in the year 1974. Bootleg tapes are historic because they capture the distinctive vocal blend for the very last time. The results were chaotic, unfinished, and technically unreleased, however, they are still considered to be historic. In spite of the acrimony that was caused by the previous breakup, it demonstrates that their connection has not been broken. It would take volumes of books, not to mention legal documents, to unravel the wide-ranging and subtle causes that led to the breakup of the Beatles. These reasons are as complicated as the five individuals themselves. It was in August of 1967 when band manager Brian Epstein passed away, which was the final blow that the partnership could have received. Lennon, who, ever since the world-beating success of 1967's groundbreaking Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, had largely abdicated his creative role due to his own emotional maelstrom of insecurity, boredom, and resentment, attempted to steer the group through the subsequent upheaval. McCartney did his best to steer the group through the turmoil, but his de facto leadership was perceived as being overbearing by his bandmates. During an interview with Rolling Stone publisher Jan Wenner in December 1970, John Lennon made the controversial statement that, we collapsed, after Brian's death. Paul apparently took control of the situation and guided us. But what is it that is guiding us because we have been going around in circles? During that time, we fell apart. That was the breakdown that took place. It was McCartney's commitment to precision in the studio that earned him the reputation of being a difficult taskmaster. He is the one who works non-stop. Despite the fact that George Martin, the band's producer, coined the phrase, over bossy, Ringo Starr reportedly quipped that John Lennon began openly criticizing Paul McCartney's work beginning with the sessions for the White Album recorded in 1968. He hated music hall-influenced songs in particular, such as Martha My Dear and Ablardier, Ablardier, which he famously referred to as Paul's grandmother's music. He was particularly dissatisfied with these songs. After Lennon stormed out of the studio, the latter song nearly sparked a battle royal, but he came back a few hours later, in a state of consciousness that had been altered by the chemical. Jeff Emmerich, who had been working as an engineer for the song for a long time, decided to resign rather than continue to put up with the negative energy that was present during the sessions. It was excruciating for McCartney to experience the animosity. John and I were both critical of each other's musical works, and I received the impression that John was not very interested in performing anything that he had not composed himself, he stated in 1971 in an interview with Life so I could feel the rift beginning to form. And John kept stressing that we were standing still in terms of our musical performance. McCartney was in charge of high-concept initiatives that the band was required to participate in, and John Lennon was not especially enthusiastic about them. The difficult sessions that were filmed for the documentary let it be documented just as many arguments as songs. The Magical Mystery Tour, which was a television film that was released in 1967, was a costly failure that was only somewhat salvaged by the soundtrack. According to Lennon, Wenner, Paul was the one who arranged for the film to be made. One of the primary reasons why the Beatles disbanded was because of this. 
Although I am unable to speak for George, I am very sure that we have grown tired of playing the role of Pius sidekicks forever. Paul was the only one who was going to be shown by the camera work that was set up. On the other hand, that is how I felt about it. Reportedly, John Lennon interpreted the song Get Back, which was a composition by Paul McCartney, as a thinly veiled barb at Yoko Ono, his new romantic partner, who attended each session along with the band. The song was the lead single from the compilation. He claimed that whenever he sang the lyric, Get Back to Where You Once Belonged, he would stare at Yoko. This occurred when we were in the studio recording it. Ono oh was not exactly welcomed with broad arms by the Beatles when Lennon made the decision to make her a permanent fixture during the band's sessions. This particular case is likely the result of Lennon's own paranoia, but the Beatles did not welcome Ono oh with open arms. The situation was similar to old friends from the military breaking up because they were getting married. The Beatles anthology contains McCartney's reflections on the band. No one was so naive as to remark, oh, you shouldn't love her, when he had already fallen in love with her. We were able to acknowledge it, but that did not lessen the pain that we were experiencing as a result of being discriminated against. It was the rejection of Ono by McCartney, whether it was real or imagined, playful or malevolent, that hurt Lennon in a way that very few things did. As a self-protective precaution, he started emotionally separating himself from his lifelong girlfriend. The fact that he initially detested Yoko and eventually came to adore her has been stated numerous times. However, it is unfortunately too late for me, he told Wenner. Even though Ringo was fine, the other two truly were the ones that gave us the runaround. That is something that I simply cannot forgive them for. I can't help but continue to love them despite this. Although Epstein had been in charge of the band's commercial dealings before to McCartney's marriage to Linda Eastman in 1969, he suggested that her father Lee, who was a famous entertainment lawyer in New York, take over the band's business affairs. Rather than favoring Alan Klein, a brusque and streetwise business barracuder, John Lennon liked Alan Klein because he had the understandable fear that McCartney's father-in-law could never be a neutral third party. Approximately 50 lawsuits had been filed against him as a result of his murky business name. Epstein had a chance encounter with him, but he declined to shake his hand. However, Lennon was captivated to Epstein because of his straightforward personality. It was then that Ringo Starr and Harrison followed suit, leaving the vote with an embarrassing 3 to 1 ratio. Despite the fact that McCartney took problem with every single business and artistic decision that Klein made for him, he never accepted Klein as his manager by any means. This was a personal insult to Lennon, who took it to heart. Lennon reported for duty at a Beatles business conference on September 26, 1969, to make his drive for independence. His confidence had been strengthened by his first significant non-Beatle live performance in years, which took place at the Toronto Rock and the Roll Revival Festival. Lennon quickly dismissed McCartney's suggestion that the band should go on tour in order to get back to their roots. Then he growled, I think you're a complete idiot. The gang is going to be split up, which is something I was not going to tell you. How does it feel? At this point, it feels like a divorce. Nobody, not even Ono, had anticipated it was going to happen. At that moment, McCartney said, our jaws fell. The other Beatles, including Klein, were successful in persuading John Lennon to conceal the information so that it would not interfere with lucrative business transactions that were already in the works. It was McCartney's hope that it was one of Lennon's melancholy outbursts, but Lennon remained consistent in his opposition. Lennon was unfazed by the news that McCartney had also decided to leave the band and was working on a solo record when he phoned him six months later to discuss his departure. According to his response, this means that there are two of us who have psychologically accepted it. It was in April of 1970 when the album in question, which was simply titled McCartney, was really released. There was a question and answer section included in the press copies that explained that the Beatles had disbanded owing to personal disagreements, commercial problems, and musical differences. 
He also stated that he did not anticipate a Lennon-McCartney songwriting relationship taking place in the future. According to Lennon, who had intended to make the major revelation himself when the moment was appropriate, the action, which made headlines across the world on April 10, infuriated him. I had the intention of doing it, and I ought to have done it, he stated at a later time. When Paul did it, which was to utilize it to sell a record, I was a fool for not doing it. I should have done what Paul did. McCartney initiated legal processes on December 31, 1970, with the intention of dissolving the partnership between the Beatles, so straining the relationship between the so-called Fab Quartet to the point of shattering. It is said that at one point in time, John Lennon was driven to the residence of Paul McCartney in London, where he threw a brick through the primary window of the house. It is highly possible that both of these tales are fictitious, yet the sentiments they express are grounded in fact. When John Lennon met down with Wenner in the same month, he was emotionally raw and had just finished months of psychologically terrible primal screen therapy. He wanted to give the readers of Rolling Stone their first peek at the band's most embarrassing embarrassing moments. It was the first time that any of the Beatles, let alone the man who had established the group and was their leader, finally stepped outside of that protected, treasured fairy story and told the truth, writes Wenner later. The release of these interviews was the first time that any of the Beatles had done so. Due to the sugar-coated mythology around the Beatles and Paul McCartney's portrayal of the breakup, he was brimming with rage and bitterness. As is typical for him, McCartney's response was more understated. He included a shot at Lennon on the opening track of his second solo album, which was released in 1971 and was titled Ram. The song was titled Too Many People, and it was a sarcastic response to the former bandmate's calls for global peace. He told Mojo in 2001 that there was an excessive number of persons preaching practices. This is the first line. It seemed to me that John and Yoko were giving everyone instructions on what to do. I also had the impression that we did not require instructions on what to do. As far as the Beatles were concerned, the entire tone of the situation had been, like, to each his own. Although only a small number of fans were able to recognize the slight, John Lennon was able to understand the reference and may have even made up a few that weren't actually present but I was able to hear them, he railed. He is so unnoticeable that other people didn't notice them. The notion occurred to me, well, I'm not obscure, I just get right down to the nitty-gritty that matters. Imagine was his masterwork from 1971, and it is best known for the thoughts of a tolerant utopia that were recorded on the first track. He responded to this masterpiece. A distune that is so nasty and overt that it borders on being obscene, How Do You Sleep, is the spiritual inverse of the song I just mentioned. A further blow to McCartney was the fact that his fellow Beatles sibling, George Harrison, was the one who played the slide guitar on the single. As Lennon, Harrison, and Ono insult their old comrade, they can be seen huddled together in the film footage of the session that was eventually published as part of the Imagine documentary. They are seen joyously grinning like children who participated in a conspiracy. Before taking a shot at McCartney's most famous song, Yesterday, Lennon sings, The only thing you done was a yesterday, and since you're gone, you're just another day. The sound you make is music to my ears, Lennon says, before taking a dig at McCartney's most famous song. During the day that the recording was taking place, Starr happened to be in the studio. He was so outraged by the lines that he pleaded with Lennon to retract his position. Lennon made an attempt to defuse the song by claiming that he was using somebody as an object to make something. This attempt was made several years later, after he had somewhat cooled down. The song I was writing was a product of my hatred for Paul, even though I wasn't really feeling that cruel at the time. McCartney was definitely hurt by the lines, despite the fact that he was reluctant to respond to them. I didn't want to get into a slanging match when John did How Do You Sleep, he said author Barry Miles in his authorized biography, All These Years From Now. Miles's biography was made available to the public.
I had the option of going for equal time and doing all of the interviews, or I could decide to not take up the gauntlet, and I remember consciously thinking, no, I really mustn't. I simply let him do it because he was being fed a lot of those lines by Klein and Yoko. I knew that I had to make a decision. The fact that John had such a sharp wit and that I did not want to go fencing with the rapier champion of East Cheam was a contributing factor in my decision to avoid the situation. That was not a viable option at all. I was also aware that those vibrations had the potential to snowball, and you begin with a perfectly innocent little contest, and all of a sudden you find yourself engaging in a duel to the death with the figure of John Lennon, and you find yourself thinking, oh my god, what have I carved out so far? Having said that, it meant that I had to take. It was with a gesture of goodwill that McCartney made his public response, which was on the album Wildlife, which was released in 1971. The Samber Dear Friend was his first endeavor with wings, and it was an open letter to John Lennon that was as honest as How Do You Sleep. An emotional McCartney seems lost as he wonders if this was actually the point at which their friendship was on the verge of breaking down. The song is built around a haunting solo piano figure. The public battle between the two parties came to an end not long after Lennon kept his reaction to the song to himself. As the middle of the decade approached, McCartney made an effort to continue as if they were living in the past despite the fact that their economic and legal concerns had become more organized. When I got to New York, I would call him and he would ask, Yeah, what do you want? I would respond by saying, I just thought we might meet. He would then inform Miles, Yeah, what the hell do you want, man? The entire situation was quite contentious and unpleasant. You're all pizza and fairy tales, John once said to me. I remember that. I thought to myself, what a fantastic album title. Well, if that's what I am, then I'm not completely opposed to that definition of me, I mentioned. I am able to think of even more depressing things to say. On another occasion, however, I called him, and he responded with a yeah. Then, yes. What is it that you want? Suddenly, he seemed to be speaking in an American accent. Oh f off, Kojak, I yelled as I slammed the phone down, we were going through those kinds of times, and it was just horrible news. In the course of the steady thawing of relations, the impossible took place on March 28, 1974, John Lennon and Paul McCartney collaborated in a recording studio. A drugged-up mess was the consequence, which is a very unfortunate outcome. With his close friend Harry Nilsson, John Lennon was at Burbank Studios working on the production of the album Pussycats. During the course of his 18-month separation from Ono, he frequently used alcohol and cocaine to put himself under the influence of these substances. He also liberally shared these substances with other players, including Stevie Wonder, Jesse Ed Davis, and Bobby Keys. Upon entering this raucous environment, McCartney made an effort to squeeze a song out of this supergroup, but was unsuccessful. After some time had passed, John Lennon recalled that there were fifty other individuals playing, all of whom were simply observing Paul and myself. The only versions of Little Richard's Lucille and Benny, King Slow Burn, Stand By Me that are revealed on the tapes from the session are only partially finished versions. The recordings were frequently disrupted by technical issues. It is the last time that the sweet and sour vocal combination of John Lennon and Paul McCartney was recorded on tape, despite the fact that it is entirely unlistenable and generally fragmentary.